We're going to take a look at 18 New England. This is a Scott Peterson 18xx game. And I have to say right off the bat, this came from a period where I was pretty much uh, more engaged in, in the used markets and whatnot. Uh, and, you know, when I found an 18xx game that looked at all interesting to me due to mechanisms or whatever, and we'll get to that in a bit, um, I would... Uh, I would almost invariably bid on it, and this is one I won along with several others. Uh, other other Peterson designs as well. I don't know which ones I've... Um, I'm pretty sure I've covered some of his games before. But in this particular one, as I was reading the rules, which are kind of iffy to be honest, uh, there are small errors in them, there are some ambiguities in them, that, or, or, or possibly even things that seem to imply uh, exactly the opposite of what they, I think they actually mean. Um, the more I looked at them, the more I realized, no, they're in alignment with the standard. Like, the intention is to be in alignment with the standard 18xx rules in, in these places. And uh, they're just worded uh, in a way that leads that up to question. Um, the rule book uses a lot of fucking color. I don't like a lot of color, but at least some of it's of importance. These red areas are meant to distinguish, and, and I'll see this uh, in the last one I was looking at. I was looking at 1822 uh, MX, which actually used the same red font, uh, red, red typesetting um, to typeface to uh, express what's different from other 1822 games, like what's different from the core. But here, uh, the decision was to take it from the core of 18xx in general. Some of which may, you know, where is the core, where is the center, whatever. Uh, and so that kind of annoys me. But there are other places where I found things that were worded in such ways that you know, I'm like, eh, which way does he mean that? Or does he really mean what I think he means? And and quite often the answer was no. He mean, unless something is stated pretty clearly, in general, uh, the, the rules actually uh, seem intended to conform with regular 18xx. It's a five-player game, and as I was reading the rules, towards the end of them, I started coming to the conclusion of, hmm, this is interesting. Uh, I'm picking games based on their mechanisms and how their mechanisms are unique in the 18xx world more than on any kind of how historical is it. Now, part of that has to do with, look, from the very beginning, 18xx started out with what I felt was... Um, a real attempt to model elements of the stock market and of the kind of wheeling and dealing that happened within the railways that are very, very difficult to do without an exceedingly cumbersome system, right? And that they did some things pretty cleverly. And then later 18xx's, started saying, well, wait a minute, what about this? Let's deal with this. So, I mean, I don't know so much um, about the old uh, 1829 games. I don't own any of them. I've played uh, one of them once and really didn't like it. It was really, really static and boring. Uh, and, but uh, when you get to 1830, there are certain elements in the, in the game that kind of graded on me as, wow, this is really not historical. One of them is, for example, um, let's take a, a, a quick thought. The, the way capitalization happened, the idea that like a group of major investors were putting up enough money to get, um, to get the corporation started, but then the bank or, um, as it were, the... Uh, outside investors or whatever 
bought up the rest of the shares somehow, but they stayed in the bank pool, in, in the company treasury or, or in the initial offering and all kind of weird stuff was going on there. And I'm like, yeah, that's not quite right. Um, the more and more some of the earlier 18xx games went, it felt like they were attempting to some extent to correct some of those flaws. And sometimes they went overboard. Uh, I, I still like 1856 the best because I feel like it managed to try really hard to correct some of them. I would probably like uh, 2038 just as much, and I don't know where the hell I have that hiding. Uh, it's got to be down here because it's an XX game. But, uh, yeah... 2038 tried to, to represent the minor companies and how they turn into majors because that's one of the other facets that wasn't really handled. Um, some of the later ones, and I, I can't remember what it is, 1849 or whatever, I have it some, oh, 1841 here, the Italian one, tried to cover all kinds of uh, facets in it. Uh, the Russian 1861 was handling mergers and stuff like that. And slowly, this beast is one I got to get to at some point. Um, it's another Northern Italy, and I think maybe an attempt to fix some of the issues in 41, essentially, uh, by a complete redesign as opposed to, I think they made like 1841, and I think they made 1842, or an 1841 second edition, I'm not sure, uh, that was basically uh, just a better version uh, of the original 41. But maybe I'm mistaken there, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember anymore, damn it. Um, but as I read through the rules of this, I started saying, wait a minute, this is like using different mechanisms, uh, primarily the idea that um, minor companies are where everything start, and they either merge or uh, convert to major companies without really paying much attention. Like some of these some of the major corporations were kind of started all on their own, right? Um, so I started getting this feeling of, huh, these rules aren't really designed to model anything specific or different about New England railroading, the early New England railroading. Rather, it's just an attempt, it seems, to use a different mechanism flow, one that doesn't allow you to just float a corporation by, by buying shares. Sorry for this intro. I'm assuming everybody who's in the video at this point still is an 18xx fan. I'm assuming if you're interested in 18 New England, you've already played some of the 18xx's. I don't know that it's a bad one to start with. It doesn't look terribly horrible. Uh, it looks one of the reasons I picked it because I was looking at uh, 1822 mechs with this idea in mind, because Peterson tends to write simpler games. Um, that one looked a little bit more complex than I wanted to tackle. I haven't played an 18xx in a while, so I wanted to get into the flow of it. I didn't want to just play one of the ones I'm used to, <laughs> and I didn't want to tackle one of the ones that maybe I wanted to explore more, because, well, it's too late now. You know? <laughs> anyway... Hmm. I swear I was born. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I started looking it over as I worked through towards the end of the rules and got to the point where I'm saying, you know, it's not like he's adding all kind of new mechanisms. He's actually largely using mechanisms that were used elsewhere. Uh, but it's odd, and there, there's no real argument that I can see for why these are all sort of private, uh, minor companies, which are essentially privately held, turning into corporations, either through merger or through, um, uh, through conversion. I, I can't see any argument for that. There's no historical reason for it. And then when I got to his designer notes, yeah, he made it explicit. Um, 
My goal for this game was to produce a partial capitalization game that does not suffer from the traditional snowball problem where highest value companies are capitalized the highest by the best trains. I, I gotta say, that's not always the case, but yeah, it, it is an issue in 18xx. But basically, he's trying to solve a gameplay issue rather than what I feel like earlier 18xx's were trying to do, which was solve the problem of how can we represent both rail building and stock manipulation and all that in a way that gives some of the correct feel and is a playable game. That's, that's what I feel was the, the marvel of Tresham's uh, early design. Um, well, 30. Uh, again, 29, which is earlier, has most of the most of the same features to it, but it just isn't as cutthroat and and doesn't really seem to I don't know shine in the way that I expect uh, the way like you know a Fisk or a Vanderbilt was was working things up anyway. It's kind of intriguing to me because I was seeking out games for new uh, mechanisms or new ways of looking at things, and he was designing this with the mechanisms in mind, but the goal was slightly different, I'd say. I'd say that my goal in seeking out games that had different mechanisms was to look for things that might spark my thoughts as to um, whether or not an 18xx, uh, whether or not a particular mechanism would work better. I'm looking for the best 18xx the most historical and realistic model of um, not so much the track building. I'm, I'm willing to accept the abstractions laying in the track building and the dots and whatnot. That's easy to fix or change if you wanted to, to make a different game. Uh, rather, in terms of how the stock market, how stocks are represented, how finances operate, whatever. So things like 1817, down there, which I covered. I've got some things that aren't uh, XX mixed in, and I, I really intended to get them all together. But things like 1817, you know, started hand, started um, refining certain concepts, etc., that had come out earlier. So, like 1856 had loans in it. 1817 kind of refines uh, the whole concept of a deficit financed company and 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 things like that. And I still feel like that was trying to reach for some kind of historical uh, aspect in addition to whatever gameplay aspect we had. But this one is just blatant. It's not trying to solve any problem that the games fail to represent properly. It's trying to provide a certain kind of gameplay. Now, something in me finds that distasteful. I would rather that the gameplay advantages emerge from the simulation. But of course, you know, if you're seeking out certain gameplay uh, or, or different play styles of the game above and beyond any kind of, uh, any kind of representational issue, um, this one might, might well be for you. Anyway, I picked it up based on, wow, why is it it doesn't allow you to do this? It was like, wow, that's a cool, interesting idea. Um, but... I'm finding that the, there's no real reason behind it except for let's make the game play a little differently. Uh, and, you know, we've got things that are also bugaboos of mine, like the Canadian National Railway operates just like a normal railroad. Again, 56 tried to solve that from, from you know, 1830 had the, uh, they had the Canadian Pacific Railway, which actually was a real ra regular railway. Here they have the Canadian National, which I really would object to being treated as just, you know, something normal. Would have much rather it be the Canadian Pacific. It still would be different, but uh, yeah. Um. <sighs> anyway, I'm going to swap batteries. We're going to dig into the rules, take a look at the differences from sort of your more standard 18xx's. If you've played some of the 18xx's, um, you should be able to follow along. I'm looking more differences from 1830 but there are other games that have that, that are kind of 
maybe considered even more standard than 1830, more available, whatever. Uh, I'm not going to say 62, that was kind of weird. Um, but it was another GMT one that is out there. I don't know where they all hide. Oh, there's 2038. Uh, uh, yeah, there was, uh, I, I want to say like 46, but I don't know where it is. It's got to be in front of me somewhere. Anyway, uh, it doesn't matter too much that I can find the box to show you that, yes, indeed, I own that game. Uh, <laughs> although something in me wants to do that for some twisted reason. But I'll swap batteries, I'll get, and we'll dig into the rules themselves. Uh, these guys, I may actually finish setup. These guys, there's 15 different companies. I'm, uh, it's 15 different minor companies. 10 of them at random are available at the start of the game. And then the other five come in later in the game. Uh, so I may shuffle and determine which 10 are the random ones because setup, well, or we may go through a setup in the rules. We kind of have to anyway. As I got distracted enough to move some around, I found some of them up there <laughs> and other places. Just starting to cluster them. Uh, there's uh, 46 now. Okay, great. I'm so happy I did that. All right. And then, you know, there's going to be another time when I decide they all have to get in order uh, by date. I even pulled Poseidon over, which is an 18xx. It's just... BC. <laughs> okay. So you start uh, this game with a fixed bank of $12,000. Um, some of the key ideas here uh, that he's putting out here. Um, so you spend your initial capital to buy minor companies and later can convert or merge those into majors. I can't think of any reason why that's more realistic, right? Um, the president is going to be in charge of issuing his shares and deciding how they're sort of released so that other you don't have to rely on other players buying your shares. Uh, it's a partial cap game. Companies are funded as the shares are bought, but the IPO shares are always going to be equal to their par value, no matter what the stock market value hits. We should go over some of the components. Um, and you can issue shares to depress your stock price by making the shares cheap to buy, and then turn around and buy IPO shares to fund the company treasure at the higher value, but you take a personal loss on that. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's take a look at uh, components. They're, they're good. It's an all-aboard games edition. Uh, the, the components tend to be pretty pretty nice. A couple of player aids. A lot of the reminders on them. Only single-sided. How about that? We got the uh, corporate mats there. The money, you have to supply your own, but it does come with a whale. Uh, stock certificates, again, good quality, a place for the bank pool. The track, now in this game, I think all the yellow tracks are considered unlimited, and everything else is limited. And, you know, some kind of weird choices in there. These are the minor companies. Stock market, it's a flat market. It's got an interesting little weird thing, though. You mark the uh, miners in these spaces. And there's a limitation to how many, you know, you can only have two miners in each of the spaces. And the green ones come in later in the game. So the miners that start the game start with a lower value, a lower capitalization. Which makes sense because the trains get more expensive, but it also has impacts on play. And then here, a place to just mark down, you know, what the last turn's earnings uh, for a corporation are. I don't think the pri the miners do that, but maybe they do. I don't know. I don't know how many tokens I have of each one. It looks like three. One's going to go on the board. One's going to go here. One's going to go up there. Sure. Okay. All right. Set up. Um, as you can see, there's not a lot of places to put things on the board. They kept the board size small. Um... 
looking for what we got. Like I said, twelve thousand dollar bank. Uh, you randomize the fifteen minor charters. I could shuffle these and deal them, deal ten out or deal five out. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is shuffle those and pull ten. Of course, there's three of each, so <laughs> I may get dupes, in which case I just pull again. And those are going to be the ones that are initially available. The other five show up later. Uh, the base game flow is stock rounds followed by a fixed two operating rounds each stock round. We should have a little, ooh, a little bit of track there. Um, yeah, here it is. In addition, there's merger rounds, which will show up later in the game, I believe, after the three trains are bought. Um, which allow you to float companies in between operating rounds or before the stock round. A uh, bunch of different trains. Most of them are pretty normal. Let's take a look at what we got. We got the twos, the threes. So the twos are rusted by the four, as you would expect. The threes are rusted by the six E. The fours are rusted by the eight E. Five is the first permanent train. It is an E train. E trains are going to be special in that um, they're able to skip small small towns, the dots, and doinkers. And if you have more than one E train, more than one permanent train, they operate together, hitting all the same cities up to the smallest of your E trains, and then double the value of that, which means that they can be very, very potent if you're hitting a high value area. And I haven't looked at the tokens to see. I'm assuming New Haven is very high value. Obviously, New York City is going to be very high value. Other places, maybe not so much. Boston is probably going to be worth a lot. The game doesn't handle the fact that some of these towns kind of grew based on the railway. Like, it handles it in the sense that the track tiles uh, improve the value of the town. But it fixes which towns are going to be the important ones. And again, this is something, you know, in more the operating side of things that I kind of like about Railway Tycoon. Uh, was how, you know, industry and whatnot was spurred by the railways. So, you know, if no one goes to Albany, well, Albany doesn't grow. But if or, or Poughkeepsie or whatever. But if one of those towns became kind of the important hub and everything ran through it, it would actually have grown more than it does. So, eh, just another side of it. Let's see, we're on the trains here. Uh, there's six E's as well, as I've said, and then there's the 80s. There's an infinite number of 80s, even though the cards, you just use something else. They don't put like 80s on the back of the twos or anything like that. They just back print it with a logo for the game. Stock market itself is a flat market and it's going to work a little differently from how um, how some of uh, the markets work. Uh, Put the pars right in here, the miners go here, and then the regulars are on here. Otherwise, it's pretty much normal. I don't know why this is underlined at all. <laughs> uh, it is kind of, it, it is a value that a lot of things will, might end up at as par. Things that are <coughs> converted end up with that as their par. So that might be the reason for that. Um, minor companies. Minor companies are wholly owned. These companies lay railroad track and operate trains, cannot build further stations. Uh, they only have one. They have their own little charter, which has room for money, trains, whatever. Um, we have a reminder here of the information on the trains. The train limit here, uh, the left-hand side limit is for miners and the right-hand side is for majors. 
you're not allowed any major corporations until the three trains come out. And we got a big asterisk there. Second round of minor companies available. Yeah. Okay. Whole series of these. The minor companies have assigned locations in the game. The corporations do not. You form whatever fucking corporation you want. So, you know, I could start the Canadian Pacific down here in New York or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I could start the Boston and Maine down there. Mm, whatever. I'll try not to. But in some cases, you'll see stuff uh, being problematic. Uh, presidency is going to handle as normal. Let's take a look at the phases. Uh... Nothing too exciting on the two-phase. Two Minor companies can hold no more than two trains uh, until phase four. Green, uh, when phase three comes out, green track becomes available, and you'll have the colors of track available here. Uh, red areas go up in value. Miners can merge or convert. Majors can only own four companies until phase four. Phase four, this is the first one that rusts trains. The twos go away, uh, still green track. Miners can only own one train for the remainder of the game. Majors can own no more than three until phase six. Then the Browns come out on the first five permanent train. Uh, red off-board areas go up in value again. Start of st stage uh, six, the three trains rust. Yellow, green, and brown track is made available. And Majors can only own two trains for the rest of the game. Now this is different from 30. 30 had... Uh, the two train limit starts on the five, even though the threes rust with the six, which could really get you in a lot of trouble. And then finally, there is a, a gray stage uh, for the phase eight. Uh, all the fours are rusted. There's no, no bonus trade-in value of a four for an eight. Yellow, green, brown, and gray is available. Red areas go up, and there's an unlimited number. Okay. First stock round of the game. Not really a stock round. <laughs> In this, players are going to be able to draft minor companies that they wish to purchase. Um, starting with the first, the player with the whale or the priority, um, and then going clockwise, and I'll go counterclockwise as I always do. Each player takes one of the following actions. They can reserve a company. They have to have enough cash to start the company at one of the available spaces for that company. Uh, that's going to be twice the value of the uh, of the space. Um, the player places the charter in front of themselves to show it's reserved and may not be reserved by another player. You can set a value for the company instead of reserving it. You take one that you've already reserved and you put its val uh, one of its tokens in the empty yellow outlined space and pay double that amount to the company treasury. This starts the company. There's a limit of two of each company at each value, either top or bottom space, uh, may be selected if it's available. So, you pick a corporate, you pick a minor company, but you don't pay for it. And in fact, you could pick more minor companies than you have money for. You just have to reserve. You have to have the money available in hand to start one of those companies. Well, to start each of the companies as you reserve it. Now, what this does for you, not much, right? The next thing is you can relinquish all your reservations and pass on all future turns in this stock round. This is what happens when you grab too many reservations and don't pay them all out. You're probably going to want to reserve a company, maybe reserve a second one, but then start buying, setting their prices so you have the cash for them. But in small numbers of players, you might want to fiddle around more. Um, you can pass, and this, uh, if you have... Uh, if you have no reserved unstarted companies, you can pass, and that'll be for the for the remainder of the round. Um, once the final player takes an action, the process is repeated in reverse in a snake draft sequence. So we'll start one side, we swing around, and then we come back, making the same choices. So the last player could reserve two companies in a row, or they could reserve and spend and and purchase the company, whatever. Um, you might find, like, it depends on how much money people start with. I think it's like 280 in the five-player game, and that's what we're going to play with. You might find you have a difficult time filling one of these. 
you know, f getting the right fit and you might have to relinquish your company because of it. All starting companies then immediately buy a two train at the end of the first stock round for $100. The cash that you pay for them, which is at least $100, goes into the treasury from your pocket when, when you uh, set the value. And then they must immediately buy a two train before the game actually starts. All right. Other stock rounds are a series of turns. They work kind of like normal stock, or pretty much like normal stock rounds work. Uh, you can sell any number of certificates, then buy a certificate. Uh, if you do neither, you pass. If all players pass consecutively, then the first person to pass gets the whale, and whatever. Um, there are limitations, though. There's a certificate limit, the maximum number of certificates you can hold. 20 for 3, going down to 13 certificates for 5 players. Uh, I don't know what counts as a certificate. I think just shares. Nope. Minor companies also count. Okay. Um, no player can hold more than 60% of a major company. This is going to be kind of problematic. Uh, in lower number of players, so this is standard rules for 18xx, but in lower number of players, what it means is companies never sell out. That may not be as big a deal in this game as in some. Um, minor companies uh, will probably form in the first round. In subsequent stock rounds, a minor company must be started directly. The company uh, may be started directly. The company must be available, not started before, and respect the minor company phase grouping, i.e. the 10 and then 5. Uh, the company's value marker must be placed in available minor company value space. And the player pays twice the amount of the share value for the minor company. I don't know if that counts as buying a stock. Yes, buy one certificate or start a minor company. Okay, fair enough. Forming a major company. This cannot be done during the stock round. It's only done during the merger phase. Uh, you can't buy the presidency or anything like that. Selling stock. Um, selling is normal. 50% is the limit in the bank pool. President's certificate can't end up in the bank pool. Um, whenever stocks are sold, the price doesn't move unless it's the president. If the president sells shares, though, the stock goes back one space for every share that he sold. I've seen this mechanism before. Uh, it leads to a tamer game. Change of presidency, pretty standard stuff. If you have your, your if, if you want to get rid of the presidency, somebody has to be able to take on the 20% share. This is one of the places where it's worded. It almost sounds like you can't actually sell the presidency. Uh, it's not worded as clearly as in some other games. Buying stock, uh, you grab a 10% Certificate from the company or the bank pool into your own hand, hand holdings. The president's certificate of the major company must already be owned by the player. The purchasing player cannot own, already own 60% or more. If you own more, you get slapped. I mean, you're not allowed to have gotten there. And you may not have sold stock in the company earlier in the same stock round. You also can't go over your certificate limit, all kind of other stuff. Uh, each share card has two sides. I'll show you here. It has a gold, so everything except the presidencies, has a gold side which indicates that it's an IPO share and a white side which indicates that it's a normal share. IPO shares end up going to the company treasury. Bank shares end up going, well, bank, uh, already regular shares don't end up uh, generating additional revenue for the company necessarily, but the company can own them and re-release them and all kind of stuff like that. In which case, the IPO isn't really an issue anymore. If the share is an IPO share from the company's treasury, the player pays the current value to the bank, I believe. Yeah, you pay the current value of the stock to the bank, and then an equal, uh, and then an amount equal to the IPO, uh, the par value, goes from the bank to the company treasury. So no matter what the stock value is, 
the IPO actually gets spent there. So what this feels like it's trying to represent is that someone else has shares of this company. You're able to buy and sell it, uh, sorry, you're able to buy and sell it at the current price. In fact, you must. And there's not gonna be any arbitrage going on. In 1830, there's an arbitrage situation, which again, causes a lot of chaos and a lot of churn in the game. And it is very intriguing what ends up happening, where people buy shares because they're overvalued. Um, well, they buy shares at par value, and they're overvalued, and then they end up selling them back to the bank pool eventually, and getting themselves a, a pile of cash. Um, that's not really available here. You've got to pay full value, and then the company doesn't get full value. So it's like a partial capitalization, but the company has, like, the company's loaned these out. I, I, it's not even, I, I can't even understand what's trying to be being represented here. I don't think anything is. It's just sort of like, oh, this is a mechanism that works different from any other 18xx. Uh, so let's put it in. Um, the, the idea feels like somebody has borrowed a share from the company and they promise to pay the IPO amount if somebody else pays it, buys it back from them. Because the shares are, that are in the bank pool or whatever are basically shares held by the investing public is kind of the concept here. But here it's like the bank doesn't have the money from the IPO, but the player is paying. I, I think their shares actually owned by a bank. Like, the bank bought them up at IPO value with the intention, eh, I don't know, some kind of loan situation or something. I have no idea what it's meant to represent. But anyhow, the company does not get its IPO money, but it's allowed to generate IPO money. And you'll see how that happens later. So as we wander away from um, actually going over the rules and instead critiquing them, if the share is a non-IPO share from the company's treasury, i.e. it was redeemed early by the company earlier in the game, the player pays the current value directly to the company's treasury. And this is something kind of like uh, uh, 1870, which allows corporations to buy back their shares and release them. We'll see the mechanisms there. Stock round ends when all players uh, pass consecutively. Unlike other XX games, or many other XX games, share value is not increased by all the shares being sold out. Which honestly kind of makes sense. So here's the thing. If shares... The reason for that is to indicate that the, there's a lot of popular desire for those shares. Which the big players buying them all out would be a representative indication. And so by taking that away, you've taken away something that was kind of present. But it's not, again, it was a simplification that 18xx put in play. But now it's not even being covered at all, right? Um, and again, a lot of subtlety went around fiddling around with which shares you hold and whatnot to see if you can make sure that your company is sold out and everything in many other games. That's taken away from here. So I actually feel like the gameplay is getting hurt by this, but it's my particular taste in gameplay, which is a very savage and cutthroat type of XX game. This feels like it's, not, it's intended not to be that at all. Which is why the snowballing problem is particularly problematic in this game. Just like it is in the 1829 games, um, because it's too staid and static. Uh, the game doesn't allow for the churn and the, the cutthroat actions and whatnot that really are what make 1830 and some of the others, 56 definitely, into, into such masterpieces in my mind. Is that the cutthroat nature makes up for um, some of the situations and, and helps balance the game out. Okay. And the worst of the static games is 1835. That thing is... 
You can't do shit in that game. <laughs> uh, see my video on it? Or videos on it. All right. Operating rounds, pretty much normal. Um, first thing, though, is you're allowed to redeem shares. We'll get to that in a bit. That can be done anytime during the turn by major corporations. Otherwise, you get to lay track, pretty much normal. You pay money only for mountains and rivers and whatnot, and only on the yellow tile. That's one of the places where the wording is problematic. Let's find it. Um, the track on the tile, so here it's lay or upgrade track, right? And we talk about the supply of the yellow track. The track on the tile must extend the route or increase the value. The track laid on the hex tile, blah, blah, blah. If the hex is labeled with a sum of money, the company laying the track there must immediately pay that sum to the bank or else the tile may not be laid. Then we go through some indications of which track can go in which spaces. And they say, when upgrading track, the old tile is removed and the new tile substituted. Plain track. It's not distinguished that you don't pay for upgrading track. I think that's intended. Another abstraction that's kind of unrealistic in 18xx games, but is very, very common. Um, what was it? 1849 had a replacement for that, where you, like, put little terrain cost markers on, on top of... And, and there may be a few others that have this, maybe without the, the same component uh, bonus. But basically, you have to pay to cross the terrain every time. Now, here's the thing. If you're crossing a river, bridging a river, you probably only need to do that once. Every railroad going through doesn't need to build, or every track section doesn't need to cross the river. But when you're cutting through mountains, do you only have one piece of track that cuts through the mountains? I don't know. It depends on the situation. It's all very complicated. And 18xx chose the first person laying track in the area pays the blasting cost for the terrain. Yeah, you blast rivers and bridge mountains. Okay, jumping back. Uh, you get to run your, tr you get to play a station marker, uh, paying for it, only by majors. You get to run the trains. You pay out your earnings. You're gonna have uh, the ability to pay half earnings here. Uh, then you can buy trains. And then if you didn't redeem shares, you're allowed to issue shares as a way of getting you more, more capital for your companies. Route definition, pretty standard stuff. Redeem shares. At any time during a company's operating turn, including multiple times, it may redeem one or more of its shares from the bank pool. The company pays the current market value for each share redeemed to the bank and transfers the share from the bank pool to the company's treasury. This will prevent the company from issuing shares during the same operating turn. I believe those shares produce income based on uh, uh, an example I saw. Laying an upgrade of track. Ah! A major company may, per operating turn, lay one or two yellow tiles or upgrade one yellow, green, or brown tile into the next color. Uh, when they're available, green tiles are available, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so this is one of those games that allows you to double lay to get you a bigger, uh, a quicker start on the board. I had forgotten about that. Okay. Uh. We got something ugly here. I didn't notice this shit. I don't know if I like this. What are we talking about here? The Quincy Hex L7. I hope these are marked as something special. There's seven. How do we get to L7? Quincy. Ah. Upgrades to a yellow city tile number six, which is a wide curve. Okay, that's not bad. M4 is Salem. I didn't even notice these suckers. Again, it's a doinker. 
but it's allowed to upgrade to something else. Now that that's problematic, but that'll upgrade to a yellow small city. Uh, number three. Mm. One of these. Okay. This one has a dot on it, so you know. <laughs> um, Lowell is K four. It's up here. Uh, upgrades to a normal green city tile. I think that includes this. I'm sorry. Yeah, that includes this connection. I think Wilmington gets destroyed basically. And Springfield G8. It's an oo Upgrades to a normal green city tile. Uh, again, it looks like it can be any type um, of green city tile that maintains the track connections that it already has. Fair enough. Station markers. First one is 40. Second one's 100. So you get your first one for free at your home. Each corporation can buy only two. You're not going to have any dominating, even, you know, the NYC, whatever, is not going to dominate this little board. Uh, station markers work as they would in other XX games. I need a break. I'm going to put the whale here to remind me. And probably go play some raid or something. By the way, it's much easier to hit these red points and try to remember if there's anything else or find anything else that's weird. Um, this is not all that different from what I'm used to. So I don't know why this is red. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, normal track runs. Uh, permanent trains, like I said, they're express trains. They run like non-express trains except they can optionally skip small cities. However, if a company has two and they're not allowed more uh, because of train limits, uh, they must combine, and the lesser of the two trains is the maximum number of cities the combined train reaches, which is then doubled for revenue. But in the event that you have three 5E trains, which is a peculiar situation that can only happen before the six falls uh, and is very dangerous, you triple your revenue. Okay, but uh, you distribute earnings. Now, in this game, you have the option with a major corporation to either swallow completely, pay half dividends, or pay full dividends, which is semi common. It's not core. Um, the dividend is paid to the holders of the shares. Shares in the IPO and company treasury go to the company. So it is still holding those IPO shares. Again, remember, these are shares that it is charging a certain amount of money to uh, to the eventual investor. Not getting the par value, even if the investor pays less than that. <laughs> it's like the idea of like a bank intermediary or whatever is really painful here. And not paying dividends to, but paying the dividends to itself for them. It's just like completely a ludicrous situation that doesn't represent anything in reality. I got some gnats or something. Um... If the company pays the shareholders, the share price marker moves one space. If the total dividends are at least uh, are at least the current market value of uh, the stock, unless it pays at least twice the current market value, in which case it moves right two spaces. By the way, when I read when I read this on my own, I don't think I read any of the red text. Like I had to force myself to. So something like this. I don't remember that, right? You start putting multicolor text in and it confuses my brain and I, I skip over it and stuff. <laughs> Even if it's the most important stuff. Um, yeah, so this has the bonus of a lot of the flat track games of you get to advance two spaces if you pay enough. 
Um, if you don't pay anything at all, you go back a space. You can buy trains. Pretty much standard rules for those. Uh, you can buy multiple each operating round, but each train is purchased one at a time. Um, a major company without a train must acquire a train during the train buying step. Why is that in red? I don't know. Like, yes, it's important, but most games force you to do so. If the company may buy any available train it can afford, yeah. Um, a minor company doesn't have to have a train. But if it doesn't have a train, it'll be liquidated um, at, the end of, uh, at the end of its turn. However, if the owner of the minor company chooses, they can conduct an emergency money raising the same way that you would for a public corporation. You, you're forced to for a public. Uh, I.e., throw in your own cash, sell stocks to, to buy it, etc. If the company is still unable to buy a train, this is interesting. After the president has contributed all possible funds and sold all shares that they're allowed to legally sell, then the player is bankrupt, and the bankrupt player is eliminated from the game. It doesn't end the game. All the companies for which the bankrupt player is still president after selling off shares are closed and removed from the game with their cash returned to the bank. Shares in those companies are eliminated without compensation. The company's station markets are removed and those companies are not available to start again. The bankrupt player's final score is zero. So there's no way you can, again, one of the, I don't know, one of the more impressive goals to me always in 1830 at least was go bankrupt and win the game, which is really cool to try to engineer. Um, no matter what, you're kind of playing... Uh, on a knife's edge to try to do it, though, so. And I've not managed it. Um, but I'm told it's possible. I mean, obviously, it's possible in the rules, but I'm told it's also quite possible to do. I think it probably requires a small number of players uh, to do it right. But the really painful thing here is that other players who are holding your shares lose them. They lose all value all at once. Realistic? Probably not. Uh, but they're probably worth pennies on the dollar as opposed to what they're usually worth in the game. Uh, the old 1830 system, this is some place where I just thought it was such a cool, cool way to win the game. But the reality is, yeah, those shares probably are pretty close to worthless. Minor company liquidation. If a minor company lo loses its train and isn't buying one, It'll be liquidated. The bank gets the company treasury. The stock value is worth nothing. The minor company is flipped over over here, so no one else takes its space. Shares in those, uh, I'm sorry. Um, the company's station marker is removed from the game and its home location is now available for a token. And the company's charter is removed from the game. So if you run your company, your minor company into the ground, don't turn it into a, a, a corporation or whatever, it's a way to get rid of it, at least. <laughs> Issuing shares. Companies are allowed to issue shares at the end of their operating term, as long as they didn't um, redeem any. Issuing shares causes money to be paid from the bank to the company's treasury in exchange for the shares being placed in the pool. If they're IPO shares, shares that have never ended up in the bank pool or whatever, or, or in a player's hands, and treasury shares may be issued... Um, Simultaneously, the bank pool limit of 50% uh, applies here throughout as it does throughout the game. Share issuing cannot be performed at the same time you redeem, or at the same turn you redeem. If one or more IPO shares are issued to the bank pool, the company receives the par value for each IPO share issued, and they flip over to their white side when they're placed in the bank pool. If one or more white redeemed shares are issued from the treasury, the company receives the current market value per white share issued. In either case, the share price moves left one space per share issue. All IPO shares that are issued flip to their white non-IPO side. I don't know why a company would hold any of its IPO. Except for the fact that the way you start companies, like, I, I think 50% of every company is going to end up in here. So you're it's not really partial cap. You're able to get 
sort of three-quarter cap, you know. Um, there's no limit to how many shares can be issued other than uh, how many are available, but only 50% of the bank pool at any one time. Well, there is a limit. You cannot issue more than 50% at once because they all go in the bank pool. All right, the merger round. From phase three, after each operating round, there's a merger round. During this round, in operating order, the president of each minor company decides whether to merge, convert, or pass uh, with the minor company. An unstarted minor company must be available, uh, an unstarted major company must be available to merge or convert to a minor. Uh, convert a minor. I'm sorry. I'm having real trouble with words today. Each major company has a par value marker, which is used to set the par value. It's just one of these desks. It's nothing special. Um, and it's going to be kind of confusing because unlike 1830, where the par value is different shape tokens from the uh, stock value, you're going to have a par value down here on the same track as the stock value. It's just kind of annoying. Um, but I guess there really wasn't room to put a separate par chart. They could have done something, gotten rid of these slices and maybe made it smaller and inset or something. I don't know. I don't know what they, they could have actually put it over here. I think that would have been a better design. As it is, it's not... This doesn't feel separated enough because it's on those same lines. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, if the president decides to convert a company, the president sets the new major company's par value at 100. No choice. The president then trades the minor company plus enough cash to make up a difference between the two-share presidency and the two-share minor company. So the minor company, let's say it started at 50, would be 100 off the price. So if you turned into a company that started at 50, a miner that was started at 50, you put 100 bucks in. Um, now you still owe 100 because you have to start at a par of 100. Whatever. Um, and you get the two-share president certificate of any unstarted major company. The cash goes to the new major company's treasury. The president then replaces the minor company's station marker with the major company station marker and moves all the minor company assets to the major company's charter. And they'll have two station markers to use at 40 and 80 bucks. If the president decides instead to merge his company, the president selects another one of their own minor companies you don't have any chance to do skullduggery here between two companies. You can shift trains. That's about it. Um, to which the active company has a route, or if they're unconnected, they have to have they both have to have home stations that are in the same hex. Uh, that would be New Haven, I think. Well, I don't know, there's a few of these. Yeah. Okay. The president adds the two companies' values and rounds down to the next available share price. These damn little bugs. Uh, to set the par value, the president then trades the two minor companies in exchange for the two-share president certificate of any unstarted major company. The president replaces the minor company station markers with the major companies and removes all minor company assets uh, to the major company's charter. If the two station markers are in the same hex, the president selects one of them as his home station. The other one goes back to the charter in the $40 cost space. Otherwise, only one station marker is available. So if you start a company before you kind of connect these, you end up in a situation where your company is now a major company that's really kind of only one of the miners, which feels a little funky. Uh, may not be a... a, a a pleasant choice to make, but it looks like merging that aren't in the same hex is going to be pretty hard. You got these. These are close together. These are pretty close together, but some of them maybe not so close. But it gives you a way to do it without throwing more cash in. The president adds the two companies' values. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, where are we? Right. Uh, for both convert or merge actions, the president sets the major company's share price market to match the par. If the selected space is already occupied, the new marker goes at the bottom of the stack. Yeah. 
Uh, the player places the 10% shares in the treasury with the IPO share side face up and flips over the merged converted miner company's stock markers so that they continue to occupy their spaces and block them. The president can now buy additional shares uh, for the par value up to a maximum of 60% holding. The money for each share sold is placed directly in the company's treasury. Any shares bought or flipped to the white non-IPO side. Uh, how does the game end? If the bank runs out of money, I think this is the int intentional basic. Uh, however, there's a second. If a company reaches the 500 space, uh, the game ends at the end of the current operating round. If the bank runs out of money, you complete the set of operating rounds and mergers, I guess, in between. If, a bank, if the bank breaks during a stock round, you complete the stock round and one full set of operating rounds. Uh, we have some extra money over there that should actually be able to handle um, anything. Getting down to the 12000 which is a fairly common amount. That's what I have to pull out. Uh, and then the final is if all but one player has gone bankrupt, and then you can just stop right there. <laughs> Each non-bankrupt player's total wealth is the value of their stock, cash on hand, minor companies valued at twice their value, uh, company assets including treasury and trains count for nothing. You could keep a miner all game long in this one. There's nothing that destroys the miners automatically. They probably will be destroyed by train, but you're able to shift trains around. You could get a permanent train on one of your miners, which is kind of funky. Uh, standard etiquette rules, two-player variant. You know, they say here, most people, uh, most players find that 18xx is generally most enjoyable with three or more players. For me, uh, for, the, for the games that I like the most, let's take 1830, which I'm the most comfortable with. I played it in four once, and it was ridiculous the amount of control that a player has in four. Like, there's an emergent chaos in an 18xx game. Now, 1830, the, the ones that I really like, 30, 56, whatever, all tend to have a lot of this chaos and churn in them. And the problem in, in three or four players, I played 56 in three. That was, that, that was chaotic because somebody was like mixing their, their own personal cash with their treasury <laughs> we had to quit but um in, in these games in, in, in the ones that i really like that are more cutthroat and chaotic um control is the anathema to the chaos it may be and i know that like some people uh the one that i pointed out um uh 46 is supposed to be a pretty decent three-player game. And I, I've played it in three, and it's okay. I didn't feel like the control was a big deal. I also didn't feel like the chaos was really all that present, even in larger numbers of players. Like, it didn't have the same cutthroat nature that 1830 did. It was one of the better ones of the more uh, stolid games, I guess. I fear this one greatly. I think this is going to probably, um, well, I don't know. Because as you add players, you do add some level of chaos anyway. In terms of what trains you're able to get, how much control you have over shifting things. But it's something like 1830. You have so much control and so much capability to do damage that you can just you know, dominate the game. Like I said, I played a four-player game uh, where I was... F there was one other player who kind of knew... Who, who knew 18xx and had played it but hadn't really uh, hit on all wheels with it. And a couple of people who didn't really know it. And I just felt like, you know, I, I had complete control of the game to the extent that I, I had... Uh, I think four companies and was shifting trains around and running companies into the yellow and, and brown and whatnot and just doing whatever I wanted and nobody could really react to it. Now, obviously, the situation wouldn't have been allowed to, have, to get to that point um, 
with more experienced players, but it really kind of soured me. And honestly, I, when I play solo, I feel like there's just not enough chaos in anything less than like five players usually. This game has a maximum of five, so. Uh, but yeah, I suspect this is one where there's not going to be as much uh, as much capability to manipulate things. And that's really where, like, the things that break 1830 in, like, four players, or and certainly in three, uh, make, um, make it the most interesting type of game. One where... There are just so many different crazy things you can do to manipulate what uh, you know what other players' position is and whatnot. And um, this game doesn't have that. You don't get to manipulate the stock values all the time. You don't get to um, that. That was such a big deal for multiple reasons. You don't get to manipulate control of uh, where priority deal is going to happen end up as easily that that was something that didn't involve buying and selling shares necessarily it involved trying to arrange the guy who goes just before you to have to buy a train <laughs> there's just so many complex things here i don't think you're gonna see that um for example i don't think priority moves on a forced sale I didn't look at that. Yeah, I don't I don't see that being being a part of a priority is only handled during the stock round. Um, I believe priority actually shifts in eighteen thirty during enforced sales. And that that creates such chaos. Maybe I'm mistaken. But I seem to remember being able to... No, it may, it may have been... I may be mistaking what I'm, I'm thinking of as, as, as a mechanism, which is not, not the enforced sa sale, uh, but rather the cr forcing a sale allowed you to get rid of shares so you couldn't be dumped on. I think that's what it is. So trying to get an enforced uh, sale of stock on yourself so that you could collect the income from those shares but get rid of them before <laughs> anything bad happens. Just really twisted shit. And you could definitely do that here. But again, I don't think this is going to be a game where people are dumping stuff all over the place. All right, I'll load this intro up. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get any playing in... Right now, I know I have like probably an hour or so left before I have to go back to raid. So maybe it's worth getting started.